Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at Blacksburg Presbyterian Church. I am so glad you're here on this gorgeous August morning. Whether you're here in person or online today or later this week, I am glad you are taking time to worship. We particularly want to welcome students today, whether these are your first few days in a strange new place or you're coming back for a fifth or sixth or seventh go-round. We are so glad you're here. It's good to see some familiar faces and new faces. There's a picnic on Tuesday night at 6, and Emily can tell you more about that at the um, table outside in the narthex. Sarah Wines has some notes about our life together. Good morning. As always, if you're um, here in person, please find the friendship registers at the ends of the pews. Put your name on them, pass them down, and greet each other by name. And um, that way you can speak to people and and make sure that you know who everyone is who's sitting next to you. Today is our monthly Sensibility Sunday, so we invite you to contribute to our anti-hunger offering by either using a marked envelope in the pew or placing your offerings in our sensibility jar, or by donating online. Next Sunday is our annual end of summer shindig. It will be held again this year at Nellie's Cave Park. We'll begin at four o'clock and a picnic will be provided. In your bulletin is a list of things that everyone can bring. Um, In addition, if you would like to contribute to the food for the picnic, it's not a potluck, but we'd like people to contribute if you are able to. Please, sign, please go to the sign-up, which is listed in there as soon as you can, so that Melinda will know who can bring food. And also, let Melinda know if you can come, because that will help her know how much food is needed. Um, I don't know where Melinda is in the congregation, but I... Um, oh, of course I do. <laughs> Melinda, is, Melinda is easy to find today. I just didn't make that connection. Ah, yes. Okay, you will notice in your order of worship that there will be a congregational meeting at the close of worship. We invite you to stick around even if you're not a member. It will be a short meeting. And you are invited to join us after worship outside under the maple tree for worship, after worship for refreshments and fellowship. Let us now center ourselves as we begin worship together. rise in body or in spirit and let us lift our voices together as we worship God. We gather in the presence of a God who has made promises that the broken can be mended and the grieving can be comforted and the hopeless will find hope. Together we lean into these promises, sometimes with strong faith, sometimes with big questions, but always with hope. 
for we've caught a glimpse of another way. join me in the psalm of the day. Praise God. Praise God, O my soul. As long as I live, I'll sing praise to my maker. Do not put your trust in human leaders, in mortals who cannot save you. When they stop breathing, they return to the earth. On that day, their plans perish. Those who joy, whose joy knows no bounds Find their help and their hope in God. God made the heavens and the earth, the seas and all they contain. God keeps faith, deals out justice, and gives food to the hungry. God sets the prisoners free and opens the eyes that are blind. Please be seated. God has always been there for us, loving us and calling us to be all that we can be. Let us tell God all about ourselves, not leaving anything out. Let us take a few moments of silence to examine our lives and our hearts in the presence of the one who loves us through and through. In our reflection, let us mark an end to this week gone by. 
Let us offer it up honestly, knowing that even with its imperfections and incompleteness, it is accepted just as we are. Let us remember the things we did last week. the times we loved well, <clears throat> and the times we did harm. Let us remember the ways we related to you. The times we felt distant from you or did not even think of you. The times we experienced your tender mercy. God of grace, we trust in your promise to make all things new. Forgive us, renew us, enable us to grow in love. Repeat after me. I am a child of God. Holy and beloved. This is our identity that we do not earn and cannot lose because it is given to us by God. And in baptism, we are reminded that we are claimed and loved. So friends, here... And trust the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And as forgiven people, we're set at peace with each other, with ourselves, and with God. So we greet one another with a sign of that peace. And as we do so, I invite kids to come forward. The peace of Christ be with you. How are you? Good morning. Let's try that again. Good morning. Good morning. All right. This is a smaller group than I thought might be here today. Because I heard something happened in most of your lives this past week. Did anything special happen? Kindergarten happened. Okay. What else? Something. Third grade. Fourth grade. Which grade? Also fourth grade. Okay. So we have people of different grades. What, what's the best part of school? What did you miss? What do you, what do you like going back to school? Get to see friends again, very important. What else? Did you miss some other things? 
You didn't miss anything? What? Playing on the playground. There are no votes for recess or lunch as being good things. <laughs> That's, I would have expected that. Well, a while back during children's time, I think you all had a discussion about promises. And today we're going to talk about promises too. What, what's a promise? Oh, what's a promise? Huh? Okay, Mom, I can't not do that. Okay. Is, is it an agreement? You mean an agreement between your mom and you? Okay. I'm not going to promise my mom that I would never hire you. Ah, I'm not going to promise everything. Right. You've got to be careful what the terms of the agreement are, huh? Yes. Okay. All right. What else about promises? I want to suggest to you that you and I have already made a promise this morning. I promised to come up here and facilitate this conversation, and you promised to be a part of it. And that's something we might sometimes call an implied promise. And there's different levels of making a promise. Maybe in the next level up is maybe you're going to uh, play softball with your friends, and you agree somebody's going to bring the balls and somebody's going to bring the bats. That's sort of an informal agreement. And you can take it up another level. Have you ever been to a wedding? Have you ever been to a wedding? Well, a wedding is a ceremony that takes place between a couple, among a couple, or two partners, who make promises to each other. And that takes it up to another level. That's, those are very important promises. And other, take it up to another level, sometimes we sign an agreement to, to something. You may have signed an agreement to go by the regulations in your classroom, for example. Sometimes we take it to a very formal level, and there are legal agreements that actually require not just the signing of the two partners, but of witnesses who say, hey, I saw that. That's really that person's signature, OK? Well, in today's Bible passage, Pastor Sarah, I think, is going to talk about uh, a little more about Jacob that we've been hearing about for, in Genesis and his desperate search for winning and obtaining things. So we'll even hear him get sucked into a couple of promises with Laban, who doesn't uphold the terms of a, an agreement they have. And putting together what we know about Jacob and what we will learn about him in further passages we find a man who is stubborn, focused on things, and not people, and not taking time to listen to God and to understand and appreciate the promises of God. God is faithful, and God keeps his promises, and importantly, he wants us to keep our promises. Jacob needed to listen to the word of God and embrace the promises of God. Will you please pray with me by repeating after me? God, thank you for keeping your promises to us. God, thank you for keeping your promises to us. Thank you for being there to help us. Thank you for being there to help us. Please help us keep the promises we make to others. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining me. In preparation for hearing God's word read and proclaimed, let us pray. Holy Spirit, you're present all the time. Awaken us to that reality so that we may see you, feel you, know you, follow you. Amen.
As we continue our march through Genesis, we are indeed picking up again with the story of Jacob. If you recall, he has tricked his father into giving him the blessing that was supposed to go to his brother Esau. And Esau got so mad about that that he wanted to kill Jacob, and so Jacob had to flee with nothing to his name. When we pick up today, he's now traveled 500 miles to his uncle Laban, who has taken him in. And in Laban, the scheming, tricky Jacob has met his match. So hear the story from Genesis 29. Laban said to Jacob, you shouldn't have to work for free just because you are my relative, which we might note as his relative, he should have just been a guest. So Laban saying, you shouldn't have to work for free, turns him into hired help. Tell me what you would like to be paid. Now, Laban had two daughters. The older was named Leah and the younger, Rachel. Leah had delicate eyes. Rachel had a beautiful figure and was good-looking. Jacob loved Rachel and said, I will work for you for seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. Laban said, I'd rather give her to you than another man. Stay with me. Jacob worked for Rachel for seven years, but it seemed like a few days because he loved her. Jacob said to Laban, the time has come. Give me my wife so that I may sleep with her. So Laban invited all the people of that place and prepared a banquet. However, in the evening, he took his daughter Leah and brought her to Jacob. And Jacob slept with her. In the morning, there she was, Leah. Jacob said to Laban, what have you done to me? Didn't I work for you to have Rachel? Why did you betray me? Laban said, where we live, we don't give the younger daughter before the older. Complete the celebratory week with Leah. Then I will give you Rachel, too, for your work. If you work for me, seven more years. So that is what Jacob did. He completed the celebratory week with Leah. And then Laban gave him his daughter, Rachel, as his wife. For the wisdom of God in Scripture, for the wisdom of God among us, for the wisdom of God within us, Thanks be to God. This is another mess. Every week (laughs) we get another one. Laban puts Jacob to work for seven years to earn a bride, but pulls a bait and switch at the last minute. And we don't know all the wedding customs, but they must have involved veils and intoxicants. And then, after this passage, there's all this wrangling about who will have children. And it says God gave Leah the privilege of having children first as sort of a consolation prize for being less loved. And then Rachel was infertile for a period of time, just like her foremothers. But then she gave birth to two sons as well. And then Leah and Rachel get in a competition about who can have the most children for Jacob. And they coerce their servants into bearing children for Jacob. And between these four women, Jacob has 12 sons who become the fathers of the tribes of Israel. This is our origin story. Our ancestors in the faith 
come from a liar, a cheat, who got tricked by his uncle, married two of his cousins, had a dozen children with four women. These are not the sort of biblical family values that we usually talk about. Can you imagine sharing a story like that over cookies and lemonade right after worship? I have no doubt it would be met with support and acceptance. But it's not the kind of thing we usually talk about at church. Lying, manipulating, consummating marriages, being attracted to someone who's not your spouse. As my mother would say, this is not for polite society. And yet our Bible is chock full of this kind of stuff. It's hard to think of any characters who are totally models of righteousness or purity or even just normal, whatever that might mean. Moses had a fear of public speaking, and that was his job, and he had a violent history. David had a penchant for other men's wives and was willing to kill to get them. Elijah couldn't take a joke. Jeremiah was too young. Ezekiel had hallucinations. The disciples were often bubbling idiots. And Paul, without whom we wouldn't be here, had a first career of killing Christians. And then there's Jesus, who was unhoused. He had nowhere to lay his head. And the rumors at the time said he was a glutton and a drunk. He loved the wrong sort of company. He was always ready to make a scene. He didn't fit in polite society. Why would the Bible tell all these stories? These are not the sorts of people I am inclined to hold up as role models. We have to cut away a lot of parts, skip a lot of things, if we're going to hold them up as paragons of goodness. It's been tricky figuring out children's times this summer. (laughs) Maybe the Bible tells these stories about these kinds of people because these are the only kind of people there are. Who doesn't have some weirdness to them? Who doesn't have some mix of incredible beauty and persistent character flaws? Maybe your flaws are more mundane than some of our biblical heroes. Maybe a tendency to micromanage or a bad habit of thoughtlessness or a persistent judgmental streak. We all have something going on. And we all have stories we don't tell in polite society over cookies and lemonade. We all have chapters we'd like to forget, and people on the family tree we'd like to not claim. These are the sorts of people in the Bible. When God wiped everyone out with the flood, the story is that God was looking for perfect people. And God could only find Noah. Then God wipes everyone else out, and Noah's family immediately messes up. And God decides and promises to never wipe everyone out again. 
not because we were some descendants of a perfect person and are ourselves perfect, but because God realizes, huh, this is just the way they are. And God works with what God has. And none of these characters' failures or flaws manage to derail the purposes of God. The persistent pull of love is too strong to be overcome by our weaknesses. So, if this is what God is like, working with regular people, with all our stuff, and this is what the Bible is like, full of stories of regular people and their ridiculousness, why do we think we have to be put together and well-behaved to be good Christians? I get why many of us dress up for church. I dress up for church. I always have. It is a way for me of setting aside this time and this space as something different from the rest of my life. And if it serves that function for you, I'm glad. When I was a child, though, it was framed as dressing up for God. God doesn't need us to dress up. God embraces us just as we are. I adore when I see children running around barefoot, their shoes scattered to the winds and covered in clothes that bear paint stains and grass stains and all the marks of a joyous embrace of life. And I love when I'm talking to someone at the beginning of worship and realize they still have a little dirt around their fingernails because they couldn't wait to get their hands in the earth. If you hate dressing up, or if you just don't have any dress-up clothes, this is your permission slip, your blessing, to come to worship in what makes your heart sing. Maybe what you wear for your acts of care during the week. Whatever will help you bring your mind and your heart and your body to worship. Jesus never liked people who put on a show. Shame and embarrassment about our flaws and our failures distorts our lives more than the flaws and failures themselves. If we accept that sin is anything that separates us from God or each other or ourselves, then shame and pretense definitely fall in that category. And it seems that far too often, rather than relieving people of that burden of shame, Christians heap more of it on people. Or at least, maybe we should just say upper middle class white Christians in the U.S. are prone to that. We whitewash the stories of Jesus. We leave out these stories from Genesis. We whitewash our own lives leaving out the messier bits. We post beautiful, happy pictures 
And maybe we include one picture of a tantrum as a joke. Even our imperfection is perfectly curated. We answer, how are you? With superficial responses, or jokes, or evasions, sometimes outright lies. I've done that. And I'm not suggesting we need to share all our private struggles with everyone we meet. We all have different temperaments around privacy. And that's fine. But what if we let our guard down a little bit? What grace might sneak in. Fred Rogers once said that anything that's human is mentionable. And anything that is mentionable can be more manageable. That's the truth of confession. That's why we do confession in our worship every week. Not so we feel bad about ourselves, but because what we mention and offer up to God can be made more manageable. And that's the testimony of Scripture. So let's make this a space where we can answer honestly. I'm struggling. I have messed up need help. Let's be a community rooted in Scripture, all of it, where we can bring our whole selves, beautiful and flawed and faithful and messy. We need that. The world needs that. And God is more than able to work through all of it. In fact, if we take scripture seriously, if we take these origin stories seriously, God seems to prefer the messed up, the unusual, the messy. We wouldn't be here in this gorgeous space The wood above us, light streaming in, music echoing over our heads. If it weren't for these ancestors who came to know the God of relentless love in and through their failings and flaws, we wouldn't be here the one who was love incarnate hadn't been born in a manger. Where there's a manger, there's always going to be some manure around. So for the manger and the manure, thanks be to God. Amen? We're going to stay seated for our song of response, and I want to invite you to let it be a time of reflection, rest. When we talk about the cry of the poor, which is what we'll sing about here, there are at least two ways that the Bible thinks about that. The Gospels remember Jesus saying, blessed are the poor, meaning those who don't have sufficient resources to flourish. And the Gospels remember Jesus saying, blessed are the poor in spirit, which is all of us. Come, let us sing.
bless the Lord at all times with praise ever in my mouth. Let my soul glory in the Lord who will hear the cry of the poor. The Lord hears the cry of the poor. Blessed be the Lord. Let the lowly hear and be As we continue in prayer, we'll begin with silence. And if you have things you would like this community to be praying with you about, you can share those on pieces of paper that are on either end of the pews and pass them towards the center aisle. Come, friends, let us pray. God, bless this mess. Bless the messes that come from joy and play and connection. Paint stains and dirty knees and a sink full of dishes. 
Let us come to see them as hymns of praise, sacraments of your grace. Bless the messes we make of our lives, the ways we wound others, ourselves, and the life of the world. Help us be honest. Learn to own rather than hide our messes so that your strength might be made perfect in our weakness. Bless the messes we make of your world. Unnecessary suffering caused by our greed and love of power and thoughtless consumption. Make us brave enough to see our sin clearly so that we might turn from it. God of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar and Isaac and Rebecca and Jacob and Leah and Rachel, hear us as we call upon your name. These are the prayers of our community. We pray for peace in Ukraine and around the world. For students, faculty, and staff, as classes begin at Virginia Tech this week, bless their studies. For empty nesters as students um, head to college. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Friends, all that we have and all that we are is a gift from God who loves us. How richly we have been blessed. And by God's grace, what we offer back can be used for ministries of justice and healing and liberation here in the New River Valley and around the world. So let us rejoice in all we've been given and all that is ours to give as we receive the morning offering.
giver of all good gifts, use these offerings and the offerings of our lives for your work of love and grace and mercy and healing and liberation. Amen. We'll have a very brief congregational meeting. I invite you to begin with me in prayer. God, thank you for worship, and thank you for meetings. Thank you for all the mundane moments through which you work your purposes. Amen. Our meeting today is for the purpose of receiving the report from the nominating committee Presbyterian churches are led by people we call elders, who can be of any age, and deacons, who care for folks. And each year we nominate folks from the congregation for those roles. And Jim Rakes has been the head of our nominating committee this year, and is going to come give the report from the nominating committee. Good morning. On behalf of the nominating committee, Heather Lawrence, Jim Rakes, Andrew Warren, and Melinda Winslow, and Pastor Sarah Wiles, ex officio, we would like to recognize and nominate this morning the members from our congregation who have agreed to serve in the positions as we will describe. First of all, I would ask you to stand, please, as we call your names. The Deacons Class of 2026, Suzanne Ducker and Linda Smith. The Elders Class of 2026, Susan Bailey, Russell Gregory, Ed Spencer, and Tom Tiller and the elder class of 2024, Deb Call. Are there any uh, additional nominations from the floor? And to offer one, you need to have spoken to the person. <laughs> Hearing none, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of these who have been nominated, please say yes. yes. Opposed? Thank you. 
so much for saying yes to this call and the ways you will serve. I invite you to rise for the benediction. Friends, go. As you go, may you go with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the unending love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit, this day, unto your life eternal. Amen.